Hello guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. As Tisa Makeover, today I'm joined by the best viewers, guys. We're going to be checking out Buddhism Explained Simply. Wow, this is going to be incredible. I haven't yeah, heard it's about religion, it's very, very deep. Uh, yeah, to be sincere, I, don't, I really don't know anything about Buddhism and um, stuff like I've that. But I know it's mostly about. practiced by Indians, yeah, so and I know that's for sure. sure. But I really don't know about it, don't really know anything about it, yeah, me so. Too. I would love to watch this for me. I would love to watch that and know more about your religion. Yeah. So it's going to be good. Uh, me too. I think it's going to be good. Yeah. So guys, after further ado, let's, let's get, get started. started. Buddhism. The mere mention of it brings to mind tranquil monks in ancient temples. <coughs> it's one of the world's largest and oldest religions. But if you live outside of wow. Asia, you probably don't know much about it. So what is Buddhism? And what do Buddhists believe? Let's find out. Let's find out. The story of the Buddha takes many different forms and you're supposed to believe whatever version helps you the most. I've read many different accounts of the Buddha's life and some portray him as a normal person while in others he's essentially Captain Planet. So I've condensed all of the different accounts together and left in all the important parts. The future Buddha was born painlessly from his mother's right side in modern day Nepal to King Shododana and Queen Maya, rulers of Kapilavastu. The king named him Siddhartha which means he whose aim is accomplished. An old hermit named Asida came to visit the child. The apparently very trusting king and queen decided to let this random person hold their child. Asida claimed that this boy would become a great emperor, but if he ever left the confines of the palace, he would become the spiritual leader of the entire world. King Shodana, who had apparently gone to the Disney villain school of parenting, decided to imprison his son in the palace, never letting him see any of the outside world. No signs of decay were permitted within his sight. Flower petals were swept away as soon as they fell, and sick and old staff were sent away. Siddhartha was unaware that pain, aging, or death existed. In order to make sure that his son would never leave, the king had Siddhartha married at 16 years old to Yashodara. It was love at first sight between the two. They had apparently loved each other in many previous lives and may even have mated while they were tigers at some point. They had a son named Rahula, who was not a tiger, and they all lived happily ever after in the king's pleasure palaces. Until a musician, that musician's ruined everything, came and sang of the wonders of the world. Siddhartha wanted to see this world and convince his father that all future emperors need to see the world they're going to one day rule, right? So the king, confident that he had tied his son down, decided that he could trust him to go outside and not start any global world religions while he was there. So at 29 years old, Siddhartha finally left the palace, but not before his dad had all of the ugly and or dead people taken from the streets. Siddhartha was having a grand old time visiting his kingdom. Till he came across a man with a bad cough, he asked his charioteer, Chandaka, what was wrong with the man. Chandaka explained that the man was sick and that eventually everyone gets sick. Chandaka had clearly not gotten the king's memo. This revelation blew Siddhartha's mind. On the next two trips, Siddhartha saw an old man and then a dead man. Siddhartha became depressed, knowing that everyone he loved would eventually grow old and die. And on his fourth visit, he came across a homeless traveller. This man had renounced all material things and was looking for a spiritual escape to life's suffering. Siddhartha, inspired by this random homeless person, decided he too had to go on a spiritual quest. He asked Chandaka to take him far away. He then sent Chandaka home to tell Siddhartha's wife and child that he was doing this because he loved them. He needed to discover an escape to life's suffering. And if he didn't, death was going to part them all eventually anyway. Which is a... That's a bleak thought. Thanks, O Buddha. Moving on, after some wandering and studying, Siddhartha went to go live with the five ascetics in the woods. The ascetics practiced extreme deprivation in order to achieve enlightenment. Siddhartha began a six year fast, sitting exposed to the elements and eating nothing but the seeds that fell in his lap. This effort turned out to be pointless however. Siddhartha realized that his mind was slow and clouded, probably on account of the starvation. This realization taught him that the true path lay between indulgence and deprivation and this is an idea he would later develop into the middle path. He gave up his fast by eating a bowl of rice milk. His five ascetic friends left in disgust, thinking that Siddhartha had given up on his quest. Siddhartha wandered until he eventually found the fig tree. He was determined to sit under this tree, meditating until he reached enlightenment. And after 49 days of intense meditating, he did just that. At 35 years of age, he had become the awakened one, the Buddha. The tree he sat under became known as the Bodhi tree, and its direct descendant can still be seen today at Bodh Gaya in India. After some consideration, the Buddha decided that he would share his knowledge with the world. He found his five ascetic friends at Deer Park in Sarnath, and there he delivered his first teaching, or Dharma, revealing for the first time his four noble truths. The five ascetics became the first members of the Sangha, the Buddhist monk community. The Buddha would wander the Gangetic Plain for the next 45 years. 
gathering thousands of followers and accepting people of all genders, class and castes into the Sangha. He died at 80 years of age near Kushinagar and his followers had him cremated and his remains spread throughout the Indian subcontinent under monuments known as stupas, which continue to be important pilgrimage sites today. Buddhism would eventually spread out of the Ganges region, first down through Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, then north over the Silk Road to Central and East Asia, and it would then spread from Tibet all the way to Mongolia where under the Mongol Empire it was brought to Russia, and then later on it would be exported further west. So now that we know a little bit more about the life of the Buddha, Let's explore the core beliefs of Buddhism. At this point, it's important to remember that the Buddha lived around 480 to 400 BC, and his teachings were recorded orally for centuries. Because of this oral tradition, there are a lot of numbered categories, which made it easier for people to memorize and recite. Numbered categories like the Four Noble Truths, which are Noble Truth number one, life is suffering. No matter what you do in life, you're gonna suffer. Ultimately, everyone grows old, gets sick, and dies. I know, I know it sounds depressing, but it gets more positive later on. Noble truth number two. We suffer because of craving. We are attached to impermanent things and because of this we are destined to suffer. We need to change what we want rather than get what we want. Noble truth number three. We can escape this cycle of suffering. Yay! Noble truth number four. The Noble Eightfold Path will help us escape suffering and achieve enlightenment. The Noble Eightfold Path is the middle way that the Buddha discovered. It lies between the deprivation of the ascetic and the indulgences of a young prince. You don't follow each step one after the other. It's more of a wheel that you spin altogether. Step 1 is right view or understanding. It is understanding that the Four Noble Truths will help you stop suffering. You need to see that everything in this world is impermanent. Step 2 is right intent. Why are you doing things? If they are done out of anger or greed, they will only cause suffering. If they are done out of love and compassion, then they will alleviate suffering. Step 3 is right speech. You should not hurt people with your words. You should not try and deceive people, obscure the truth through muddy language, or take part in gossip. You should be truthful and clear always. Step 4 is right action always strive to do good in your actions. Do not act in a way that is negative. Right action also covers the five precepts, which are like the Buddhist Ten Commandments. They are 1. Do not harm any living creatures. 2. Do not steal. 3. Do not engage in sexual misconduct. 4. Do not lie or hurt people with words. And 5. Do not take intoxicating substances. Step 5 is right livelihood. You should earn your living in an ethical way. You shouldn't be involved in arms or drugs trading and you definitely shouldn't be involved in the slave trade which the Buddha was very strongly against. Step 6 is right effort. You should always go about your life with a positive attitude and some enthusiasm and you should always want to improve who you are. Step 7 is right mindfulness. You need to pay attention. When you walk in the park you need to live in that moment. You shouldn't be thinking of something awkward you did in school 10 years ago or whether or not you'll be promoted next year. You should be able to live entirely in the present moment and be mindful. Step 8 is right concentration. The ability to focus on a single object or concept, be it a rock, polar bear, cat gif. Right concentration helps you focus your mind and see things how they truly are. Right concentration and right mindfulness are important parts of Buddhist meditation, but we won't cover that in this video. By following this noble eightfold path, you can reach nirvana, the state of enlightenment that the Buddha reached under that tree. You reach nirvana when you extinguish all wants and desires. Okay, so let's take a more bird's eye view of Buddhism. Buddhism is split between two major branches, Theravada and Mahayana. Theravada is the older of the two. It's also considered to be a bit more orthodox. They think of the Buddha as a more human figure, and there is a focus on using meditation as a way to reach enlightenment. Within Theravada Buddhism, there is a belief in three things. Nothing is permanent, life is suffering, and there is no self. There is a huge emphasis on monastic life and rebirth in Theravada Buddhism. Only monks can really reach enlightenment. Mahayana Buddhism, which means Greater Vehicle, is younger and considered to be more accessible to normal people. It's called Greater Vehicle because it's supposed to allow more people to achieve Nirvana. Mahayana contains a lot of different schools, such as Zen, Tantra and Pure Land Buddhism. They believe that enlightenment can be reached in a single lifetime and that you don't need to be a monk to do it, anyone can. Mahayana is the more religious of the two as well, and has things called Bodhisattvas, which are people that have achieved enlightenment but delay Nirvana to help others do the same. There's also more emphasis on idols and godlike beings. Today, Buddhism is a religion of about 488 million people, or about 7% of the world's population. Nearly all of them live in the Asia Pacific region at about 98.7%. Every other region has fewer than 1% each. Buddhists, though, only make up about 12% of the Asia Pacific population, and half of all Buddhists live within China. But there are large Buddhist communities across Asia, especially in Thailand, Burma, and Japan. So there we have it. The Life of the Buddha, The Four Noble Truths, and The Eightfold Path Explained. This video is meant to be a quick introduction to the topic and as part of a larger world religion series. 
I hope that I've managed to teach you something new, and who knows, maybe you're even one step closer to Nirvana. If you'd like to know more about Buddhism, why not check out these books on Audible? I have a link in the description and help support the show. Do you know any interesting facts or stories about Buddhism? Please let me know in the comments down below. Guys, this was really amazing, guys. Uh, Siddhartha, I think I've heard her name before. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, after his, the king, his father, tried preventing him from seeing the outside world. You know, destiny is destiny. What is De meant destiny. to be, we shall be. Uh, he coming out from the, just a little space the father gave him, he saw the world, how the world is, mm. and how people live, people get sick, people die. He realized, like, that point of realization, like, uh, I don't know about this before. I want mm -hmm. to know more. Uh, it's very, very good. Uh, through him, 488 million people and a Buddha. Uh, and they're following his teachings. Mm -hmm. um, the Four Noble Truths, according to what the guy said. It was really amazing watching this video. Uh, his teachings, are, to me, they're fully true. Yeah. Like, they're all true. Right there, the water say, teaching them not to steal, to live a noble life, to... To avoid some certain things, no mm -hmm. sexual immorality. Uh, it's very, very good, and it feels like he was really a wise man. I feel like yeah. he did he get his knowledge from a wiser person, or he just meditates throughout. That's is be my question to you guys. Uh, what I see here for this, he was just meditating throughout. I was not just coming to him while he was meditating. Because the same meditated for like 45 days or yeah. 49 days. 49, so was he meditating throughout or was he getting some teachings from someone? So I want to get a kind of like clarifications. Um, the entire video itself was really, really amazing. Now I know a little brief about the Buddha and where it's coming from, guys. Mm -hmm. And I know about China. I know China yeah. practices um, India, but mostly Af mostly India yeah, yeah. practices it. Uh, this was really amazing and I'm really glad the trees stay in India yeah, now because there. some people don't are not mindful of their where they're coming from, yeah. their history. Uh, it's glad, I'm glad. I'm glad and the entire video itself as a summary, I just want to know more for me. I just want me to know too. more. I couldn't say you should read more books on mm -hmm. Amazon. So I want to know more. You can comment down below what you think about it, about your suggestion. Um the practices you guys practice, um, the teachings we're going to read through. Uh, just keep on commenting, and uh, we'll be able to be enlightened by what Buddha really, really stand for. Because what that, my question is: Was he meditating throughout, or was he guided by a higher um, advisor, like someone who is more knowledgeable than him, who counsel him? So I just want to know more about it. And I think I said before Jesus dealt. BC, yeah, something, BC something before down, Christ. Yeah, before Christ. So, I just want to know more. So, if you can enlighten us in the conversation, what do you think? It feels very relaxing, if I must say. Because it's just simple rules, like we can all abide to. Yeah. Do not do this, do not do that. And what I love more about it is the focused concentration. Yeah. You see, most times you get distracted by little things. Let me say, you are going to cook or something, maybe you are going to write your assignment, and then you just see TV. You, you have this, your concentration is, you're already distracted yeah. because you want to watch what is right there. But I love the fact that they're talking about concentration. Like, if this is what you're looking at, be focused on that. Don't keep your mind somewhere else. And I really want to even start meditating because I feel it helped me concentrate a lot better. But this was very interesting. I love every bit of it. I love the way he explained um, the religion. It was very simple and straight to the point. And it makes you understand and know more about them. But honestly speaking, I would love to see more about this. Um, the Four Noble Truths was really, really enlightening because guys are like, yes, there's, life is suffering. And most times we choose what to suffer for because you can just say, I want this. So because you don't have it, it's going to give you some like pain or you feel incomplete without that. And so it's what we pick, that's what gives us the suffering we have. But this was very, very enlightening and interesting. I would love to know more about Buddhism. Yeah. So guys, please let us know what you think about our reaction. Please make sure to like, subscribe and share our videos. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.